Welcome to our final panel before lunch, which is titled Strategic Risk and Military Power, a briefing to the next president. I'm Dave Barno, and I'm joined by Dr. Nora Bensahel. We're both co-directors of CNES's Responsible Defense Program. And we've got an uh, unusual opportunity today to uh, think a bit about the future. We've chosen a novel format for this particular session. Our assembled experts on stage will be asked to brief our next president just after his or her inauguration in January 2017. So we've asked them to project a bit into the future, two and a half years down the road, and give the new commander in chief their best insights on the state of US national security as of the beginning of 2017, the first month of the next presidential administration. And we're asking them to touch on the defense budget, military power, and global risks. So let me begin by setting the scene in January 2017 very briefly. In broad terms, intentionally so, the world has careened forward from today without any major game-changing eruptions. In a sense, a muddling through scenario. Put simply, we're looking at a world in 2017 in, in our scenario that you might describe as status quo plus. We may have a chance to talk about a few other options as well. In 2017, the global economy continues a slow recovery with flat growth and stubborn unemployment, with the United States faring only slightly better. Across the international map sheet, U.S. troops continue to be globally engaged, but in smaller numbers. Our military strategy is largely unchanged. In January 2017 in Afghanistan, only a few hundred troops remain, effectively ending a 15-year war. Al-Qaeda continues to present a menace regrouping in remote regions around the world, but has not yet been successful in another major attack on the United States. China and Russia are increasingly assertive in their neighborhoods, continuing to pressure U.S. regional interests. Iran has fortunately slowed its march to acquire a nuclear weapon, but remains a volatile and unpredictable regional threat. North Korea also continues to be unpredictable and a dangerous actor armed with a number of nuclear weapons. In Syria, the long-running civil war, now in 2017, has settled into a simmering standoff between the rebels and Bashar al-Assad. Here at home, defense expenditures and around the world, defense expenditures among our allies in Europe are at record lows, lifted only by increased spending by those that are bordering Russia. In Asia, a number of our friends are now beginning to invest more in 2017 in defense, given their worries about China. At the Pentagon, the 2011 Budget Control Act has returned in full force. Since 2016, so-called sequestration levels of cuts have stayed in place with no relief and are projected to remain at that level until at least 2021. No substantive reforms to pay benefits, overhead, or defense health care have materialized. The military continues to shrink in size and be more and more stretched. On the domestic front, the 2014 and 2016 U.S. elections have delivered split government to Washington. But, spoiler alert, we are not going to predict the 2016 White House results here. The Congress and the White House have struggled with sustained gridlock over the last several years, with neither side seemingly willing to seriously consider compromise solutions. The November 2016 election just over, in a sense, was a referendum on whether the people of the United States support that approach. Yet the results in 2017 seem promising. There's fresh hope in the air in Washington. New faces inhabit the White House and the Hill with both a new administration and very large numbers of new members arriving in the Congress. For the first time in nearly a decade, there seems to be an opportunity in January 2017 to start fresh. 
with hope, too, of a reappraisal of U.S. national security. So given that quick backgrounder, let me turn the floor over to Dr. Nora Bensahel, who will introduce the experts assembled here to brief the new president and also to moderate the discussion to follow. Dr. Bensahel. Thank you. We'll start uh, in the panelists moving left to right in the order that you see them on the stage. Uh, to uh, my right, your left, is Roger Zakheim, who is a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and is of counsel to the law firm Covington and Burlington. He was formerly a deputy staff director and general counsel of the Harm, uh, House Ar Armed Services we Committee. Did a lot of harm too. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and the deputy assistant secretary of defense for coalitions from 2008 to 2009. He also served as the co chair of the Romney for President Working Group. Next, we have uh, Michelle Flournoy, who's been introduced to you several times this morning, so I will just remind you that she is currently the uh, Chief Executive Officer of CNAS, uh, which she co-founded with Kirk Campbell in 2007. Uh, and from 2009 to 2012, she served as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. And then immediately to my right uh, is General James Cartwright, uh, who retired from the Marine Corps after nearly 40 years of service, including serving as the eighth Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He also previously served as the commander of U.S. Strategic Command and currently is the Harold Brown Chair in Defense Policy Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. So we'll start with you, Roger. What do you tell the new president? So I'll, I'll just start with the gender neutral uh, POTUS. And we'll move from there. But, you know, there is a consensus uh, that our military and, and, and national defense is in a state of crisis. You know, others, I believe, on the panel Perhaps I'll go into the details of that crisis, but suffice to say, we have the budget challenges, the readiness issues, the shrinking force and shrinking force structure, and then the unrestrained growth in the Pentagon's personnel and operation and maintenance accounts. And General Barno has outlined that global threat environment that underrides or uh, undergirds all that as well. Even if we assume that the status quo, it's fair to say that we're facing unprecedented challenges. Uh, the threats are diverse. They're distinct, and they span the globe. Uh, the combination of a decade of war, um, our domestic fiscal policies, has led you know, all our senior military leaders to conclude uh, we're in a period of significant risk. And I don't believe this is an exaggeration. So the question for the next president is, you know, what will your administration do about it? What can your administration do about it? And I think the first thing you have to understand is that the Pentagon needs to get back to regular order. I saw this a lot in the Congress. Budget pressures, be it the Budget Control Act, we've heard a lot about that today, sequestration, government shutdowns, continuing resolutions, that parade of horribles has essentially put blinders on the Pentagon. No fault of their own, but it's set them into perpetual budget churn and has distracted from the military's core missions of planning, deterring, and defending the country. And our senior leadership in the Pentagon has essentially become a force of green eye shades. And it's time to rebuild and reorient the force. We have to have the military focus on the threats, not the sequester. That will require presidential leadership. We have to jettison the notion that it is a national security imperative that the military contribute to deficit reduction. We've done enough. Half of the deficit reductions done by the government to date have come from the military. So to rebuild the force, you need to resurrect a strategy that was in place before the sequester and before the Budget Control Act. Um, you know, I think a decent, a reasonable place to start is the last strategy we had that took account of the world as it was instead of being bounded by a budget that nobody wanted. And so I think the so-called Gates budgets from 2011 is a reasonable place to begin. Which gets to the next point, how can you achieve this rebuilding? You know, to me there are three critical steps, none of which are particularly novel. One is create a strategy review that is unbound by the Budget Control Act, reflective of the new security environment. And we can discuss the contours of that strategy perhaps in the Q&A. Two, you have to end the sequester through your first budget request. Own the budget numbers, presidential leadership needs to be behind it, and dare the Congress to spend less. Three, negotiate on benefits and reforms. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit now on the politics of all this, and, and because it's key. Essentially, the political branches have failed to end the sequester, and at the same time, failed to embrace long-term reform that the sequester perhaps would have been the silver lining for, such as reforms to benefits and pay, force structure challenges, those are things that have been mentioned. Now, I'll depart for a moment 
from the blame Congress approach, you know, the trope that everybody loves to uh, add to. And I will be uh, perhaps the constituency of one and give a different perspective on why the political branches have failed. Um, and it's not simply just a parochial Congress. I don't think there's been serious engagement with the Congress. Sending over the same proposals every year, blasting Congress for inaction and parochialism, you know, is certainly a safe and effective political way to go about doing business, but it doesn't lead to progress. That's what we've seen for the past three, five years. Moreover, it's a mistake to think of this as a partisan problem. You just look at the Democratic Senate, Senate bills that have come through the Congress the past couple of years. They look more like the House Republican bills with respect to national security and national defense than you do the Republicans' administration's request. You have to think about why. Why is that the case? Sir, there's parochialism there embedded, but there's also this notion that the Congress essentially rejected a budget-driven strategy. Now, they want to have it both ways. We could talk about that in the Q&A. They have the Budget Control Act. At the same time, they don't want to make the, strate the strategy changes to reflect those means, but it's also different actors within Congress that are doing that. And you have to understand that the 80 plus people that do defense policy in the Congress are there to protect those benefits and provide for the men and women in uniform. So let me close, because I'm probably over my time, that making these challenges, no question, will be hard. No one has figured out how to undo the sequester or not. It will take the full backing of the president's bully pulpit, something that I agree with Paul Ryan saying this morning, who internalizes a significant risk for our country posed by the BCA yoke that's burdening our military and restraining our power. But the key point for any new commander in chief is that the significant risk that your military leaders warn of will need to be addressed. The question is whether it will be at a time of your choosing. This is an opportunity to shape events before events shape your administration. Michelle. So uh, bottom line up front. If we return to sequestration levels in, for funding uh, for DOD, uh, by early 2017, I think the next president will inherit a military that is sliding into crisis. The force will be considerably smaller. Only a small fraction of that force will actually be ready to respond to crises. The technological edge uh, that has enabled US military superiority for decades will be eroding or at risk in some critical areas, and will likely be facing a significant retention crisis as the best and brightest begin to vote, vote with their feet and leave military surface, service. So how could this happen between now and 2017? Under sequestration, US defense spending will decline from about 3.7% of GDP today to a roughly 2.7% of GDP over the next decade, the lowest level since the interwar period between World War I and World War II. Under sequestration, the US military will shrink in levels to be below what it was um, on 9-11. The Army would go down to about 420,000 with just 37 brigade combat teams, both active and reserve. The Navy would shrink to 320,000 with fewer than 260 ships. Com contrast that with the uh, FY12 goal of 323. The Air Force would go down to just over 300,000 uh, with a shrinking fleet of aircraft. And the Marines would go down to about 174,000. Under sequestration, perhaps most worrisome in the near term, the readiness of, of the force, its ability to rapidly prosecute its mission successfully and at acceptable levels of risk, that would co continue to decline. Uh, just think about some of sequest sequestration's more recent impacts and imagine them compounding over the next several years. Uh, for the Marine Corps, more than 60% of the non-deployed units experience degraded readiness because of sequestration, either shortfalls in equipment or personnel. For the Air Force, in April of 13, when sequestration took effect, it caused many fighter squadrons and bomber units to stand down. Essentially, pilots were told to stop flying. Before sequestration, readiness uh, was about 40, 54, 55% of the Air Force combat units were mission ready under sequestration. Over time, that would go to in the 30 percentage points. Army, uh, under sequestration in 13, the Army had to cancel six of its planned 
uh, brigade ro uh, rotations, uh, its field exercises at the combat training centers, and only about two or three of the Army's BCTs were ready to deploy to contingencies other than Afghanistan. In addition, helicopter pilots, number of flying hours were so reduced that 750 helicopter pilots were left untrained, and it will take the Army two to three years to recover uh, their readiness. The Navy, in 2013, the Navy had to reduce the number of ships deployed from 105 a year ago to 95 today. It had to reduce its carrier presence in the Gulf um, and reduce its operations and maintenance accounts so that only one deployed, uh, one, I'm sorry, one non-deployed carrier strike group and one non-deployed amphibious ready group are available uh, as surge forces. So what does all this mean in practice for a new president? It means that if defense spending does return to sequestration levels, the next president will come into office with severely constrained options for responding to crisis overseas, for protecting our interests and allies abroad, for using uh, uh, forward deployed forces to deter aggression, to reassure allies, uh, to reinforce the international order, um, and very limited opportunities to engage with partners to build their capacity. So whatever the next president's views of U.S. leadership in the world and the importance of global engagement, the U.S. armed forces, after years of sequestration, will be in a posture that some will nevertheless perceive as a sign of American retrenchment. Fewer forces deployed overseas, fewer forces available for engagement exercises and training with allies and partners, fewer forces at the ready to deter, deter aggression, reassure allies, and respond to contingencies in critical regions. And if there is a crisis that requires the next president to actually use the military in a significant manner, um, sequestration will mean that we will do so at much higher levels of risk. What does that mean? That means slower response times, less capable forces, longer timelines, and potentially more casualties. This is not likely to be lost on our allies or our potential adversaries. And so the next president will have an immediate challenge of needing to take steps to shore up reassurance and deterrence. But under sequestration, his or her options will be quite limited. Sequestration will not only undermine the near-term readiness and response, it will also endanger investment in the future capabilities we need, the innovation, the modernization, that will determine whether the U.S. military actually retains its superiority, can meet the demands of a future and more challenging security environment. Our technological edge is not a given. It's something that requires careful tending, consistent investment, and yet our R&D investment, the seed corn of our future capability, has already fallen by nearly 20 percent, I'm sorry, 10 percent, um, under sequestration, it would be slated to fall nearly 20% uh, by 2018. And I'm sure that General Cartwright may speak to this um, as well. Sequestration's negative effects would only be magnified if Congress continues to refuse to allow DOD to pursue reform measures uh, aimed at driving down unnecessary costs while improving performance. For example, if the Congress refuses to allow for any additional rounds of base realignment and closure. For example, if it fails to give Secretary, the Secretary of Defense the authorities and incentive pays he needs to reduce excess overhead, reshape the civilian warfare, uh, I'm sorry, workforce. Uh, authorities that, oh, by the way, his predecessors, when they were in times of drawdown, were given. Uh, if the Congress refuses to allow modest reforms in compensation and benefits, if it fails to support the kind of smart acquisition reforms the previous panel discussed. If, all, if reform gets the hand, <laughs> the DOD will be forced into the position of having to bleed readiness and modernization accounts once again to support infrastructure overhead it doesn't need and inefficient business practices. So let me just say on a personal note, as the wife of a Navy uh, retiree, and as the mother of someone who's about to sign up to serve, I would encourage the next president to rethink what do we mean by keeping faith? It's not just about protecting 
compensation and benefits for those who have served. It's about also ensuring we, have, we make the investments to keep those who we will send into harm's way in the future, give them the readiness, the training, the equipment to be successful at minimal risk. So the next president will face a very difficult set of choices and trade-offs if um, the, the Congress does not approve the president's request for an additional $115 billion over the next five years if we go back to sequestration. And so in that context, I would urge the next president uh, to focus on three priorities. Number one, engage the Congress to conclude a comprehensive budget deal at not only as an economic imperative, but as a national security imperative. Make the case that we cannot balance our budget on the back of discretionary spending or defense spending alone. Uh, and there are serious risks, uh, accumulating risks, in trying to do so. Put everything on the table, entitlement reform and tax reform, and spell out in excruciating, explicit detail the growing national security risks of living with sequestration. Number two, uh, as you increase defense spending, set very clear priorities. First, request emergency funding to restore the readiness shortfalls for crisis response forces and to bolster our forces that are rotated or stationed forward in critical regions. Two, restore critical research and development funding. Increase funding in those cutting edge capability areas that will mean the difference between our success or failure in the future. And finally, press the Congress to give the Secretary of Defense the authorities needed to reform and reshape the defense enterprise. BRAC, compensation and benefits reform, reduction in force authorities, meaningful levels of voluntary separation incentive pays, delayering headquarters, I could, the list goes on. But the, set, the, the, the administration needs to be given some tools to actually re reshape the defense enterprise and position us for the future. Um, I think the, the first obvious thing is that the name of this panel is really last panel before lunch. <laughs> <laughs> know the audience. Um, <laughs> I'm going to take a look, and those of you that know me, I'm going to kind of take a different look at this. Um, remember, five minutes is about the time it takes to walk from the sit room to the oval. Um, and that's realistically probably all the time you're going to get. <laughs> um, but having done this a couple of times, um, most of the presidents that you have the opportunity to talk to are not thinking about internal, they're thinking about external. You're just walking into the job. What's the world I'm walking into? What are the tools that are in my bag? Um, what do I think I want to accomplish? And now that I've met reality, what do I realistically believe I can accomplish? Um, is probably on his or her mind, just to keep this balanced. Um, I think there is a tool out there that um, I th I know I used very um, a lot, and I know presidents have used a lot, which is called the um, NICS Global Trends, um, published on a regular basis. It is probably the preeminent document that looks out over the horizon and gives you a sense, whoever you may be, a sense of the realities of the world that you're likely to enter, and also helps you set a path to where you want to go. And the idea here is not to chase the hockey puck, but to be where the hockey puck goes. You, know, you want to be in, in front of this. Um, in the global trends, current global trends, which I think is probably one of the best, and it's unclassified, um, it, is a, it is a great document. Um, as you sit down and read that and look at the things that might be out there in the future and think that there'll be another one before this president, so I've taken the opportunity to kind of generalize up, but in conflict, and in, in dealing up front here with the, the types of threats that are out there, as a military person, you generally think of most dangerous and most likely. Okay, most dangerous, existential to our existence, 
a threat that is really significant that for the most part today after the Cold War is just kind of overlooked, which unfortunately for us will not be the case as we go to the future. And so in most dangerous to me, the, the two key activities there um, are nuclear and biological. Um, nuclear is one we've been, hand, you know, has been around for a while. What are the alternatives to mutual assured destruction? What kind of strategy would you look for in a world that has more than one and more than two superpowers? So a multipolar world. And how do you think about this in terms of nation state versus nation state? and terrorist versus nation state. Both of those are potentially existential threats, particularly as we get to the bio world. And the diffusion of power and the availability of the technology to have an existential threat in either the nuclear venue or the biologic venue is realistic and is now called by our intelligence communities as the two main existential threats that we will face in the future. What are we doing about those and how would we do it? And I'll, I'll go into that a little bit here. On the most likely side in conflict, again, this is not you know, country versus country, what, what country is gonna do something. But one of the keys is gonna be, Mr. President, you know, the transition of the United States to a multipolar world in which our margin for superiority is gonna be reduced. Some will call that decline. Only in Washington is increase in capability decline, okay? But, but it will be perceived as decline. I mean, we're already doing that. Our budget is growing, not as fast as we want, therefore we're in decline in the United States. There are other superpowers who are reducing the margin of our superiority over this period of time. They are likely to reduce the margin, not surpass, reduce the margin. That's likely to cause tension here, at home, and abroad. Um, allies wanting to know, do you still love me? Are you there for me? All of those questions you know, are going to be um, sources of conflict, potentially, as we go forward. Um, the maldistribution of financial and natural wealth. Okay? The haves and have-nots, the separation between the haves and have-nots growing, whether it be in wealth, dollars and cents, whether it be in energy, water, climate, you know, minerals, you pick it. Um, there is going to be competition on an ever um, overpopulated earth, um, and it's likely to lead to the potential for conflict. Um, as you look at that, um, you know, you, you now start to get to the issue of the last panel, which is disruptive technology. Okay, we are entering into a world which every person can say for all of time that is more and more dynamic. Okay, change occurs faster and faster. The question that we have to under, try to understand is, where's the black swan in this? What where nobody's paying attention to? How are we ready for a black swan? Or are we ready for the, you know, the, the kind of perceived existential advantage? So in other words, my neighbor just invented something that basically is an existential threat to me. What do I do before they field it? Where does that put me in the world? But this perception of a strategic imbalance between allies, between adversaries, is likely to be a source of conflict. Um, and and it, it is probably one of the more dangerous sources. Technology has wonderful opportunity and creates wonderful opportunity for us. And of course, being the United States, I mean, I'll speak as a Marine, you know, change and advances in technology is great as long as I control it. You know, we're in a world where we will not control it. I mean, we will not be the only smart people on the planet, and others will come up with technologies that put ours at risk. That's just the reality of the world as these margins start to reduce. So, Mr. President, some desired national security attributes that I think you're gonna to have to pay attention to as you look into this new world. Two presidents got together, China and the United States, and said, we ought to have a new superpower relationship. What is it? 
Um, if it's not going to be containment and it's not going to be mutual assured destruction, which don't seem to me to be terribly plausible, what is it going to be? It's on your watch to develop it. But my recommendation is that you start to define key elements, define initial steps that we could take together, confidence building type of activities, and then long-term goals. Where are we going in this new relationship? Okay. Um, I think I saw someplace, and Michelle's probably got the numbers better than I do, that you know, the word innovation solved almost every problem in the QDR and defense strategy. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> but that it were so simple. Um, for me, at this level, it's probably the definition of, of innovation is capabilities for which process and incremental change are no longer sufficient. Okay. That, that's really what we're talking about here. It's the 10x change out there that starts to solve the problems that you really can't solve with process, um, group hugs, things like that. These are, the, these are disruptive and they're, they're clearly breakout. Um, what is it you want to do innovation for? Where would you put your money on this? And only speaking from the defense perspective here, I'm not trying to say something else isn't equally or more important. But the number one risk that innovation needs to address in the eyes of the current Secretary of Defense is capacity. Michelle laid out the numbers, reductions, etc. The question is, if we want to remain a global power, what are the capacities we're going to need? We can have the best ship in the world and one on each coast will never be in the right place at the right time. Okay? So we have to, on this journey of exquisite that we've been on for the last 50 years, we have to now start to address capacity okay? in very innovative ways. And my comment when I was on active duty was, don't come to me with less than a 10x advantage. Not really interested, because the rules and the process will eat away half of that advantage before you ever field it. Um, the second one is agility. Okay? We live today in an industrial society. Okay? We build an airplane or a ship or a tank it takes us 10 years to you know, get it through all of the hoops, then we start building another five years to first unit equipped, that kind of. So 15 years ago, we envisioned the problem of the world that we're in today. It's never right. We have to adapt. So agility is the ability to stay competitive with your adversaries in the real world you actually live in, not one you hoped would come 15 years ago. And you cannot do that by, by making the base platforms. They take too long. We have to find things like mission equipment, modularity. You know, there are all sorts of neat buzzwords out there. But the IT, and I heard it in the last panel, the IT and the platform need to be segregated in a way that is more beneficial to where our leverage is going to be, which is in the algorithms at the end of the day. Um, the last is affordability. Okay. Uh, I heard uh, a contractor to remain unnamed say, you know, if you just give me a stable base, I could build all of this widget that you need and I could give it to you for 10% less than you're paying today. That does not solve the problem of affordability. Okay. Um, think of things like what I'm going to pick on a certain, uh, I see a new word, Navy. Think of things like, Sorry, he had That's the uniform. Good for in the yeah, front row, <laughs> um, of fielding the first directed energy weapon on a ship this summer and thinking about 87 cents a shot. You know, the upside potential to something like that versus firing a million dollar missile at a $10,000 boat. You know, <laughs> we've got to change that perception, we've got to change that mindset. Okay. Improved. Um, improved national security toolbox. We need far more tools to prevent conflict and to manage the escalation of that conflict in the most likely scenarios that are out there. OK? 
Okay, and we're thinking about it, but we're not sure exactly how to handle it. Um, things that have graduated effects. Think of, think of Spock and his little, okay, set it to stun, Captain. No, okay, set it to kill. What, how do I manage graduated effects in cyber, in directed energy? What kinds of things can I do that allow me to incrementally manage escalation where I want to basically stop it and get it back where it belongs? Tools that do that. Increase the integration of all elements of national power. That's a buzzword. You have to always have to say that. Um, <laughs> increased, in, increased decision time for senior leaders. What kinds of capabilities will draw things out and provide more time for leadership to make good, coherent decisions? Um, and what are the tools they need to do that? And finally, you know, find a mentor and constantly reassess because you should not pour in stone any of these ideas. The world will constantly change under your feet, and you must be ready to accept those changes. So I heard a couple of common themes across your comments, um, both having to do with the concept of risk, that we're in an international environment where the risks are high, a lot of uncertainty about the direction that threats are going, some of these existential ones that may be manifesting themselves in new ways, but also a lot of risk about uh, strategic surprise and the potential that we're not going to be as ready as we are, Michelle, something you highlighted very strongly for the challenges that come up in terms of having the right resources, capabilities, and training in order to address those challenges. We gave you one particular scenario to focus on for the future president. Um, what, what I'd like to do in, in some of the time that we have left, and I do want to open it up to questions, so I'll ask you to keep this relatively short, is to ask you from this scenario, you know, the, the, the scenario that we picked about 2017 is, is in some ways the easiest to plan for, right? Because it's a linear extension of a lot of the trends that we face today. But, but as you mentioned, you know, we're not usually right in predicting that, uh, you know, linear extension. That's not usually what happens coming true. So I'd like to ask each of you, what positive or negative developments do you see coming up in either the, the world stage or domestically in the U.S. that could fundamentally shift the situation for the U.S. and how that might change our calculations of these risks and and preparations for the future. I, guess I would start by saying, you know, there's any number of scenarios that could, um, despite the strong desire of the American people to sort of, you know, end a period of war, that could draw us into another conflict situation. You know, if you imagined another 9/11 attack on the United States, I think over the last decade or more, we, you know, we've become very confident and very comfortable that we are safe in the homeland. And yet, the number of groups and individuals, the growing number of groups and individuals who continue to plot against us um, and the number of plots that continue to be foiled you know, on a regular basis, I think you know, another attack on the American homeland would be, I think, a potential, uh, a major change in the scenario you painted. Um, another one would be something that happens in Asia. If one of the conflicts that, or the, the tensions between, say, China and Japan over the Senkakus, or uh, China and Vietnam, or the Philippines and the, East, and the South China Sea, if that were to erupt through miscalculation on either side into some open conflict with real loss of life, um, that I think could um, uh, put us in a, in a different uh, situation. And then lastly, I would, um, I would note, you know, uh, our good friend Vladimir Putin. Um, you know, we, we seem to be at a pause in Ukraine, but what if he gets a crazy idea and decides to move into a NATO member state, you know, do something in the Baltics or something? I'm not saying that's likely, but that would certainly be a game changer. I'll, I'll just build on that point. I mean, I think, you know, we heard earlier talking about possibility, you know, with what's happening in the Middle East, Syria, certainly with Mosul and Iraq, the, the notion that we somehow, you know, will not get into another land war because we said we're not getting into the land war. Events outside, you know, might change that. Uh, and we're not ready for the reasons that Michelle outlined. Second one, which is fairly new, um, is that, and I think we're inching closer to this, is adversaries and perhaps enemies are tempted now to test our treaty alliances. Gets to Michelle's point, but I just want to amplify it a bit. This notion that, you know, 
we're coming right up to the edge of Ukraine, but what about the Baltics? Same thing, you look at the Asia scenario. We have treaties there. What is, it, what is our treaty with Japan? What is our obligation? And you know, some of the points that are made earlier kind of then come into the fore because we're not ready. Uh, we're so imminently focused managing our fiscal crisis. Um, you know, a lot of what I, and this kind of departs a little bit from what General Cartwright said, but you know, a new, the new president will only be able to control so much. You know, the events around the world, they're, they're, they're spinning and they will continue to spin once he, gets, he or she gets into office. Um, but the domestic issues that we've seen play out the past three, four years, the president can shape, can impact. Um, what we have today looks very similar to the, in some respects, to the, um, you know, the, the, the treaties that we had um, limiting our ability to grow in the 1920s. You know, we were complying, we weren't able to build our navy, we weren't able to um, uh, build our army, and as a result, we weren't ready to go, even as the world spun out of control. I think um, three things. Uh, the, under the most likely rubric, um, something relatively small, uh, a conflict, um, you know, whether it be at sea or otherwise, gets out of control because of a lack of tools and, and management of escalation and turns into something far more significant. That, I think that's, there's a reasonable chance of that. We're going to have to manage that on a regular basis. Most dangerous um, is probably, at least in my mind, is nation states get weapons of mass destruction usually to guarantee sovereignty. Terrorists get them to kill people. It's, it's the nexus between terrorism and whatever that weapon of mass destruction is that could fundamentally change the game for us. And I think probably in, in the third one, um, this is one of those places where my mind just went blank, um, you know, the, the third area here is, is the idea that um, the United States decides to, to have a different role in the world. And we decide that we're going to go inward and isolate. Um, that could make a major shift in all of the things that we just discussed. Great. With that, I'll open it up to questions. We only have a few minutes, and boy, I saw a lot of hands shoot up right away. Um, <laughs> let's start in the back on the aisle. Again, as a reminder, please uh, state your name and affiliation, and please ask a short question. Brian McGrath, the uh, Ferry Bridge Group. General, you seem dismissive of the contractor who suggested that stability and predictability could help with affordability. Um, what is your view on how those are related? Well, I think that what you want to do is, and I think I heard this from Bill Lynn in the last panel, is that for platforms, you know, wishing that you could build them in a day is interesting, wishing that they could be free is interesting, but the reality is they're complicated, they're sophisticated, and you must allow a process that, that allows the engineering, et cetera, to, to occur. You can do things that are smarter and, and and I'm not wishing away or dismissing the 10% in, in that discussion, but usually algorithms versus platforms, the time to field, et cetera, and putting them in the same rule set, so to speak, really dismisses the leverage that you can get potentially from, from something like an algorithm solution to a problem you have on the battlefield, okay? By the same token, the potential in the industrial side of what additive manufacturing is starting to be able to do may actually make platforms at least much more competitive than they are today in, in the timelines. And so I'm dismissive only from the standpoint that 15 years is just too long to project out and wait for something. We had to build one platform for this current conflict um, it was a cost-imposing strategy on us, but we had to do it, and that was the MRAP. Had to be done. We just couldn't find another way to solve that problem. That's where our strength is. We're good at that, but that's a cost-imposing strategy on us. You build a million-dollar vehicle, and for five pounds of explosives, you've got to add another 2,000 pounds of armor. That's not where we want to be on that discussion. So, Way in the back. Bob Kozak, Advanced Biofuels USA. Uh, in, in none of your comments, uh, nothing was said about the potential or the possibility of reviewing our entire way of conducting war and occupation. Uh, it, it would, the, the question is, you know, much, much, much as it was after Vietnam, a war we lost, we went back and self-examined and came up with a much better approach to doing things. 
I would, I mean, can't we say that we did things really wrong in Iraq and Afghanistan if you look at the outcomes versus what we wanted? And the question is, uh, don't you think it's time to ask the next president to really have the defense uh, est establishment go back and really look at how they conduct war? I'll, I'll start on that one. I, I think you raise a really important point that in our rush to sort of get the two wars in our rear view mirror, we risk not actually taking a clear-eyed look at what worked, what didn't work, why at the strategic level, at the operational level, and try to digest some learnings from that before we rush away from it. I, I think it would be dangerous to just assume we will never have to deal with counterinsurgency again, never have to deal with you know, safe havens for groups that are uh, trying to attack us and so forth. Um, but I do think we need to slow down and really learn from this recent experience. I would hope that that's going to happen before the next <laughs> president gets into office and that that's some of what we should be debating seriously um, in the next, in, in the next uh, couple of years. I just want to add real quick that I think what you've seen to date is a lot of people felt, yeah, we, we can't do Iraq again, we can't do Afghanistan again. The new defense strategy, most in part because of that view as well as the fiscal constraints, has said, well, we just won't do that. Right? We will just reduce the army to a certain size, and then we will just, it, it, it's something that if we ever need that capacity, um, it's reversible. Um, and I think that needs to be revisited as well, because I don't think that's, that reflects the, the his history and our experience and a particularly safe way to approach it. Unfortunately, we only have time for, for one last question here on the aisle. Uh, my name is David Marr, and I'm a recent college graduate. This question is specifically for Michelle and General Cartwright. Uh, I read a study by Harvey Sapolsky saying that 70% uh, of our military budget is spent on personnel costs, and a majority of that goes towards logistics and support. So my question is, shouldn't it be more of an issue of reallocating the resources that we already have in the defense budget rather than spending more or spending less? So. Personnel costs are growing out of control. Most of it is actually going to um, health care programs that have gone from roughly 6% of the budget to 10%. You know, $19 billion in 2001, now, what, 25, uh, $65 billion in uh, 2015. So, you know, out of control. Um, having looked at this a little bit, I firmly believe that you could actually at least maintain, if not actually improve, the quality of care and reduce cost if we took a very hard look at how we're delivering health care. There's a lot of anomalies in the system, a lot, of, a lot of just places where it's just ripe for bringing the kind of best practice that's transformed patient care at the Cleveland Clinic, or you know, pick your example out there. Um, this is an area where we, there's a lot of work that can be done, and it doesn't have to mean less quality care. It means a smarter way of providing it. But if, unless we get our handle on the, that entitlement cost growth within DOD, we will squeeze uh, the space for readiness, modernization, real capability to defend this country. Let me just stay in that vein on the medical side. Uh, and I absolutely agree with, with what Michelle uh, just gave you. But um, we came into this war where the the preeminent approach to medicine was called triage, which the military invented in the Civil War. At best, it's given you a 66% survivability rate. We got rid of that, and we picked up something else called today, hour to live. But basically, you're dealing in 97 to 98% survivability with a mortally th or like threatening wound. Okay. That's interesting. That's innovation. That's technology. The dollars and cents of that is we got rid of 57 field hospitals and all of the doctors and all of the nurses and all of the support staff that it took to have them fielded. Now, MASH is a great television show, but it's hugely expensive. Precision weapons got rid of 60% of the Army's rolling stock. It's that kind of leverage that we're looking for. We're going to have to take care of people. 
Now the question in the medical side is now can we bring that technology into the civil sector, which it actually is migrating very nicely on its own. And there are a lot of things going to happen, but medicine will all be expensive. The military is the McDonald's of the government. You know, we want a high school graduate with two years max of, of um, vocational training, okay? If you're starting to fly airplanes, when I came in during Vietnam, we had enlisted pilots, okay? Now you have to have a master's at least in aero and information technology to fly an airplane. It's crazy. We've got to get the interfaces between pilot, et cetera, back to where they belong. Today, if you look at the uh, uh, Predator, the Air Force is using and the Navy are using pilots to do that, F-16, F-18, whatever, okay? The Army is using sergeants. We've got to start to do what you just said, reallocate in smart ways here, and get the age of the force back down to the high school graduate. You know, we turn 30% of this force over every year. We've got to focus on that. If we let that age, that's going to cost us a lot of money. Old people get sick. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> on that note. <laughs> I now find myself in the dangerous situation of standing between you and lunch. We will uh, break until 1.20, but before you rush for the doors, please join me in thanking our panelists.